to destroy the works of the evil one and the kingdom of darkness with light and to rescue men from the law of sin. This is the gospel of Christ to proclaim good news unto the poor. The gospel of Christ, spreading the soul-saving message of Jesus. And now, Ben Bailey. This is the gospel of Christ. The Word of God says that Christ purchased the church with His own blood. Acts chapter 20, verse number 28. We're so glad that you've joined us for our study of the Lord's church as we look into what the Bible says about the church being essential to God's plan and essential to salvation. Friend, we want to encourage you, if you would, to have your Bible handy. Make sure you've got it where you can look to the Word of God with us as we're going to be studying from the Scriptures today on what God says concerning this powerful subject. We hope that you'll also consider visiting the Church of Christ in your area. The local congregation of the Church of Christ would love for you to stop by and visit their assembly. You'll find people there who love God, who are friendly and concerned about souls, and who more than anything want to help men and women go to heaven. If you've got a Bible question, they'd be happy to sit down and discuss the, the church or the plan of salvation with you anytime. And friend, as always, we want to encourage you to check out our website. It's located at thegospelofchrist.com. From there, you can find all our Bible study material available and free of charge. We have written material. We have videos and audios. Today's lesson and every other lesson is available from our website. You can fill out a media request form, and you can either get a digital download, or if you need a DVD or a CD, we also make those available to you free of charge, and we encourage you to check those out from our website. And don't forget about our Android and Apple, our, our smartphone apps. You can download those in the respective Android or Apple stores, and they're a great way to study God's Word as we live such a fast-paced world today. And friend, we want to emphasize this as we bring our series of lessons on the church to a close. We want to emphasize that our main emphasis in this is to glorify God and His church, and to point men and women toward the unique nature of the Lord's church. We're not concerned about your wallet. We're not concerned about your money. We're not concerned about those type of things. We want men and women to be saved. And we believe God and His Word and His church is where salvation is located. And so we hope you've got your Bible today as we think about this great subject on the Lord's church. Now, let's think about this. Why do we need to think about the essentiality of the Lord's church? You know, we live in a world where too many people want to be definitively indefinite. That is, they don't want any definites, no standards, no hard and fast rules. If you ever say anything's black and white and right and wrong, people don't like that. There's a pervasive mindset, even in the religious world, that says such things as, give me Christ, but not the church. Friend, have we really thought about that? The Bible says that Christ is the head of the church. Does the church have a decapitated head? Are the two separate? No. Christ and the church are one. He's the head. It's the body. And without both parts, the church is not what God wants it to be. This is an important topic because so much preaching today is watered down and afraid of saying anything that might offend anyone. Now, friend, it's not our purpose, our intent to offend anybody. We want to speak the truth. Galatians 4.16 says, Have I become your enemy because I speak the truth? Our intent is not to offend. Truth might offend. But there's so many who won't say what the Bible says because they're afraid of offending someone. And thus, on such a vital subject, we need to speak with great clarity on what the Bible says concerning the distinct nature of the church. Acts 20, verse 27, we are to teach the whole counsel of God. And so let's ask today then, 
How is it that, and why do we affirm that the church is essential in God's plan of salvation? Friend, it's essential because Jesus Christ died for it, and it's His blood-bought institution. Notice in your Bible, Acts chapter 20. I want you to look at this passage with me to see how important the church is in God's scheme of redemption. It's so important that Jesus purchased it when He died. Look in Acts chapter 20, and I want you to notice what Paul says to the elders in Ephesus. Paul says, Therefore, take heed to yourselves and to all the flock among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers, notice this, to shepherd the church of God, which He purchased with His own blood. Did Jesus purchase something? that's not essential? Of course not. Would Jesus die for a non-essential institution? Absolutely not. Friend, listen to these passages. The Bible teaches that the church belongs to Christ. When Jesus came into the region of Caesarea Philippi, Matthew 16, verses 13 through 18, He asked His disciples, saying, Who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? So they said, some say John the Baptist, some Elijah, and others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. He said to them, but who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered and said, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus answered and said to him, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I also say to you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. The Bible also teaches the church is the body of the saved. Ephesians chapter 5, verse number 25. Acts chapter 2, verse number 47. The Bible teaches the body of the saved is the church. And so the church is the body of the saved. The body of the saved is the church as well. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 22 and 23. Now, friend, I want you to hear these words well. Jesus only promised to save His church, and He taught that all other teachings contrary to that would be destroyed. Matthew 15, verse 13. Every plant which my heavenly Father has not planted will be uprooted and thrown into the fire. Now I know Jesus wasn't talking about horticulture there. For Jesus said in the very next breath, Let them alone. They're blind leaders of the blind, and if the blind lead the blind, they both fall into the ditch. What was Jesus talking about? Methods of teaching, doctrines, ideologies, religious groups of men that were teaching things contrary to God's will, and thus only the body of the saved, the church of the Lord Jesus Christ, can save men. Thus, it's essential to salvation in each and every way. You know, everybody draws a line somewhere, right? Uh, for example, sometimes people say, well, that's, you're drawing too hard of a line and you can't ever... Sa-. Wait a minute now. Everybody draws a line somewhere, right? What some would say, if we ask the question, is faith essential? Well, most people draw a line in the sand and say, absolutely. If you don't have faith in Jesus, it's impossible to be saved. Hebrews 11, verse 6. If we ask the question, is grace essential? Well, people will draw a line in the sand and they would say, most definitely, grace is essential. Is repentance essential? Jesus said it was. Unless you repent, you'll all likewise perish. Belief essential? Without faith, we can't please God. You must believe that I am He, Jesus said in John 8, verse 24. Is baptism essential? Oh, friend, why not? Here's what we need to do. Why not let God draw the line for us on the essentiality of the Lord's church? Everybody has a definite that they follow. Let's let God in His definite be what we follow in this life. And so then we think about the question, why is the church essential to salvation? Well, here's why. The church is essential because preaching Christ and preaching the church are equivalent. I want to show you that in your Bible. You know, sometimes people will say, we've got to preach Christ, we've got to preach His salvation, we've got to preach a scheme of redemption, but what we fail to leave out is, you can't preach Christ 
without preaching his church also. How do we know that? I want you to see it in your Bible. Would you look in Acts chapter 8? Did you know that preaching Christ means we preach the church? Look in Acts chapter 8. And I want you to know, notice what Philip did. Acts chapter 8. The Bible says this. Then Philip went down to the city of Samaria and preached Christ to them. Okay, so Philip went down there, he preached Christ. Well, what does it mean to preach Christ? What did Philip actually preach? And whatever he taught, that's essential for us, right? Look at Acts chapter 8, verse number 12. But when they believed Philip, don't miss this now, as he preached... The things concern the King of God, the kingdom of God, and the name of Jesus Christ, both men and women were baptized. And so the Bible tells us he went and preached Christ. The Bible further tells us he preached to them about the kingdom of God and the authority of Jesus Christ. What does it mean to preach Christ? You can't preach about the head and leave out the body, can you? You can't preach about salvation and not tell them where the saved are, can you? You can't preach about Jesus' death and not preach about what is death purchased, can you? Preaching Christ and preaching the church are equivalent because He's the head, the church is the body, and He died so that the church could be purchased. All right then, let's think about another reason. The church is essential to salvation. The Bible teaches that when Christ comes, He's going to save His people and take them home to be with Him in heaven. 1 Thessalonians 4, verses 13 through 18, We'll meet Him in the air, and thus we shall always be with the Lord. John 5, verse 28 and 29, All are in the graves will one day come forth. Those who have done good to the resurrection of life, those who have done evil to the resurrection of condemnation. And so it is a basic Bible truth. When the Lord comes, He's collecting His own and He's taking them home to be with Him. Friend, do we realize that those who He's going to take with Him to the Father are in the church also? Look in your Bible in 1 Corinthians 15, and I want you to notice what the Scripture says in verse number 24. Look in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse number 24 says this, Then comes the end, final curtain falls, when He delivers the kingdom to God the Father, when He puts an end to all rule, all authority, and power. Christ is going to take everybody home to be with Him. Who are those people He's taking home? Those who are in the kingdom of God. Therefore, to go home and live with the Father, I must be in the church. The Lord adds to the church daily. Those who are being saved. It's essential that I be a member of the Lord's church because that's the people that are going home to be with God. The church is also essential to salvation because our name must be on God's divine record of the saved. Uh, Revelation 13, 8. Revelation 17, verse 8. Uh, of the redeemed who are standing on Mount Zion, the redeemed who are with the Lamb, the Bible will say, these are they who, who, who are on God's name, who have their names written in the Lamb's book of life. Only those written in the Lamb's book of life are going to be saved. Friend, it's those in the church. They're the ones who have their name on heaven's registry. Hebrews 12, verse 23, our names, in the people who are in the kingdom of God, the, which cannot be shaken uh, for the, from the foundation of the world, they're the ones whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life. And thus, to go to heaven, to be with God, I need to be a member of the Lord's church because it's essential to salvation. Friend, let's also realize this. The church is essential because Christ is the head of the church. Ephesians 1, 22 and 23, He is the head of the church, which is His body, the firstborn from the dead, that He may in all things have the preeminence. And so Christ is the head of the church. Now notice this, the church is His body. Colossians 3, verse 15, and Ephesians 1, verses 22 and 23, we are the body, He is the head. And so if Christ is the head of the church, we're the body. Let's realize this then. There's only one body, one spirit, one faith, one Lord, one God, one Father. There's only one, one body. Christ is the head, we're the body. 
Therefore, to say Christ, not the church, is essential, you decapitate the head from the body. Now, friend, is that really what God's plan is? Do you have a decapitated body running around that's not essential, doesn't matter if you become a part of it, and it's headless? Well, no, that, that sounds like something out of a horror story, not something you read from the Bible. Christ and the church are uniquely inseparable in that He came to save those who are a part of His body, and they'll go home with Him to live forever. Friend, the church is also essential because Christ came to save the lost. Luke chapter 19, verse 10, the Bible says, Jesus came to seek and save that which is lost. Well, where is those who are saved from their sin? Where are they at? I want you to look in your Bible, if you would, in Ephesians chapter 5, and I want you to notice, since Christ came to seek and save the lost, Let's realize the church also plays a part in that as well. Ephesians chapter 5, look at what the Bible says in verse number 25. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her. They might sanctify her and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word. He's going to set apart and save those who are in the church. Therefore, one must be in the Lord's church. We're not talking about man-made institution here, okay? We're not talking about denominations. We're not talking about groups that wear men's names. Jesus came to save the lost. He's the Savior of the body. Ephesians 5, verses 21 through 31. And therefore the church is essential to where one must be to be saved. Think about this also. The church is also essential because salvation is found in Christ. 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 10, the Bible says salvation is in Christ. If I'm going to be saved, I've got to be in Christ, right? How do I get into Christ? The Bible says in Galatians chapter 3, verse number 27, that to get into Christ, I must be baptized into His body. When I think about that idea, salvation being in Christ and being baptized into His body, I need to realize that Jesus truly is the way to salvation. So if salvation's in Christ and we are baptized into His body, friend, let's also realize one is baptized into the body of Christ. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse number 13. By one Spirit are we all baptized into one body. We cannot separate the salvation that is in Christ and the salvation that we find as members of the Lord's church. To say that the church is not essential, that you don't have to be a member of the Lord's church, that you can be a member of any man, where do we find that kind of teaching in the Bible? You know, friend, here's what we do find. We find that man-made religions and man-made organizations and denominations are contrary to the teaching of the Bible. We find that God wants us to stay true to His teaching and make sure that we follow it in every way. I want you to look in your Bible in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, and I want you to notice a passage about this in verses 10 through 13. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, I want you to notice what the Scripture says about man-made religious groups and how they are not pleasing in God's sight. Paul said this, 1 Corinthians 1 verse 10, Now I plead with you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same thing, and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. For it has been declared to me concerning you, my brethren, by those of Chloe's household, that there are contentions among you. Now I say this, each of you says, I am of Paul, or I am of Apollos, or I am of Cephas, or I am of Christ. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? When we think about 
uh, God's plan, we realize that it's not division and denominationalism. God planned to build one church, Matthew 16, verse 18, and notice how what was going on in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 10 was different than that. Paul said, I've heard that there are divisions among you. Here's the problem going on. One of you, each of you says, I'm of Paul, or I'm of Paulus, or I'm of Cephas. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Were you baptized in the name of Paul? In essence, you've got people saying, yes, I, I'm a follower of Christ, but I'm of the sect that belong. We follow Paul's teaching. Or Apollos, we like the way he preaches. Or Cephas, we can really relate to him. And so we're Christians, but we're also Cephites. We're followers of Peter. Wait a minute now. What did God say about that? Let there be no divisions among you. God said that that denominational division in the first century was wrong. And friend, the same principle is true today. God's people cannot let denominational error and denominational teaching override the powerful principles of the one church and the unity we need as God's believers. Friend, when we think about salvation, it's such a beautiful picture in the Bible. Listen to these verses. Let's think for a moment about how does one become a member of the Lord's church? The Bible says this, that God wants you to be. 1 Timothy 2 verse 4, God wants all men to be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth. God wants you to be saved. In fact, God doesn't want anybody to go to hell. That's what the Bible says. 2 Peter 3 verse 9 says, The Lord's not slow concerning His promises, as some men count slowness, but He's long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. God wants, doesn't want anybody to be lost. wants everybody to be saved. To the point that God sent His own Son to die for mankind. The blood of bulls and goats could never really take away sin. Hebrews 10, verse 3 and 4. Uh, Without the shedding of blood, there was no forgiveness of sins, though. Hebrews 9, verse 22 says, And yet we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that He, by the grace of God, might taste death for every man. Hebrews chapter 2, verses 9 through 12. God sent His Son to die for man so that we can have salvation. And friend, that plan is so readily available for men and women today. Saul asked a great question in Acts chapter 9. He was going down the road to Damascus to do great harm to the Lord's church. And the Lord confronted him along that journey, blinded him with that great light. And Saul cried out, Lord, Lord, what would you have me to do? And he was told, you go in the city and it'll be told you what you must do. Friend, what was Saul of Tarsus told to do to be saved? And what must a person today do to be saved? You know, we hear a similar question in Acts chapter 2. Peter has stood up with the eleven on the day of Pentecost and he has proclaimed, therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly God has made this Jesus whom you crucified both Lord and Christ. And verse 37 says, And they were cut to the heart. And they cried out, Men and brethren, what shall we do? And Peter with clarity told them exactly what to do. And then we hear it a third time. Acts chapter 16. Saul, Paul, and Silas are in prison. Uh, they're praying, they're singing, the prisoners are listening to them, and God answered their prayer. A violent shaking of the prison occurred. The doors were open. A jailer awoke. He realized his own fate. If the prisoners died, his life or left, his life is on the line. And looking, he called for them, grabbed a light, called for them, and asked this great question. Sirs, what must I do to be saved? Friend, let's take just a couple of minutes and let's put together what God says about salvation. 
What exactly does your God want me and you to do? What does He want us to do to be saved? Well, friend, the Bible clearly teaches I must hear the Word of God. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. Romans 10, verse number 17. For without faith, it's impossible to please God. Hebrews 11, verse number 6. Once I've heard the message of the Bible and been convicted by that message, I must believe that Jesus is the Christ. In Acts chapter 8, as Philip is in the chariot with the Ethiopian eunuch, in the distance he sees water. Hey, here's water. What hinders me from being baptized? If you believe with all your heart. You may, Acts chapter 8, verse 33 through 37. And so, yes, a person must believe Jesus is the Son of God to be saved. You must repent of sin and turn from it to God. Acts 3, verse 19, Peter told those in Solomon's portico, repent and turn that your sins may be blotted out, that seasons of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. And friend, one must, with his mouth, confess Jesus as the Savior. Romans 10, verse 10, With the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. And yes, just as in the example of Saul of Tarsus, and just as in Acts chapter 2, men and women must be baptized. Saul was told, Why are you waiting? Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins. In Pentecost they were told, repent and be baptized every one of you for the forgiveness of your sins. Acts 2.38 and Acts 22.16. Friend, our hope and prayer today is that each of us will realize Jesus died for the church. It's essential. I want to be a member of that church and we hope and pray today that you'll seriously consider obeying the gospel, becoming a Christian so that one day you can go home and be with God in the Lord's church. You may have just joined our program and are wondering, what is the Gospel of Christ? The Gospel of Christ is an evangelistic work of the Churches of Christ that reaches the whole world with the Gospel through TV, radio, and Internet. Our motto is to take the whole Gospel to the whole world. We believe in having a book, chapter, and verse for everything we say and do. And unlike many religious groups today, we're concerned about lost souls, not your wife. This is the Gospel of Christ. We encourage you to visit thegospelofchrist.com for a host of Bible study material, as well as video and audio from our lessons. If you would like to have a copy of today's lesson, please visit our website and fill out a media request form. You can also reach us by emailing mail at thegospelofchrist.com or call us at 844-6-GOSPEL or write to us at the address on your screen. You can also get our Gospel of Christ app on your handheld devices for those on the go.